Good afternoon. Welcome to Noontime Prayer and the reading of Psalm 15. Really glad you can uh, join me today. I've been reading a little news this morning. I try to stay away from it, but uh, I read a little bit. It was depressing to read it. Part of, partly what's in the news right now is there are protests going on around the nation to restart our economy, to let people go back to work, and so on. I read an article yesterday that our superintendent, Greg Yee, recommended that it, it may be a while before we can gather in groups again. So it's we're going to have to be patient with this. At the same time, uh, it directs me how to pray in the midst of people getting really anxious about the economy and about their lives and about the future. About the future. I was reading uh, about st statistics this morning. And if you look at the case statistics, the death rate is hovering between 3.4% and over 4, 5, 6%, even 7% in countries. But when you figure in all those people who have not been tested but and, and who have been asymptomatic, it appears that it's around 1.1% uh, is the best estimates, which is 10 times worse than the, than the seasonal flu. So it's still very serious. So let's begin with prayer today, and then we'll get to the reading of our psalm. Thanks for uh, joining me again. My wife's here with me today, and I just really appreciate the time that you're taking out of your day. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this world you've given us. Last night, Nancy and I were walking out in the neighborhood, Lord, and we heard one of those American white crown sparrows singing. And they have such a beautiful bird song, the song that you gave them. And again, in the springtime, I hear all of creation celebrating your presence, celebrating your glory, shouting out praises to your name. The trees dancing in the breeze, the flowers reflecting the light that you created, the grass growing so slowly, but growing, living so beautiful in its hues of green. I just thank you for all creation around us, the stars. I've seen Venus out every night in the western sky, that planet that I've seen since I was a little boy. And I thank you that that reminds us that you're, you are our constant companion. You never leave us nor forsake us. Right now I pray for our nation as the news sometimes or many times sensationalizing things now is suggesting that there is going to be demonstrations across the United States. I don't know what's true and what's not tr true. Sometimes or a lot of times the news exaggerates, Lord. But I pray that you would bring peace to this nation as you bring people to trust in you. And our most fervent prayer, Lord, is that you would use this pandemic to draw people's hearts to you, that they might turn and believe, be persuaded by your word, that Jesus is the one through whom all things were created, that he is God in the flesh, and that he is the Messiah, the one who came to save us from our sins by offering up his perfect life in our stead, in our place, as that once and for all sacrifice. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, so once again, I pray today that you would fill us with a great and extraordinary measure of the Holy Spirit throughout this day, throughout this week, throughout these days during the pandemic. Teach us to ask, Lord. We have not because we ask not. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would teach us to ask for the Holy Spirit, that you would fill us, Lord. You desire us to be filled. And so it's one prayer we know when we ask, we will always receive. When we seek, we will always find. When we pray that the Holy Spirit would open doors for us, those doors will always be opened. And so we pray that you would bring this pandemic quickly to a close. And yet in the same breath, I pray not, not our will, but your will be done, Lord. Your will be done. We pray for some of the regions being hit the hardest I saw a map on Reuters today that shows where the heaviest concentrations of the illness are, and it's mostly back east, that heavily populated east, including New York and uh, Michigan. 
Pennsylvania, even Rhode Island, and down even to Louisiana, Lord. I just pray that you would comfort those families who have lost loved ones. The, the death toll keeps rising rapidly and it's, it's expected to rise for some time. We pray for a minimum loss of life, Lord. We pray that just as a great storm fell upon the disciples while they were on the lake in a boat and you were asleep in the stern, when you awoke, you said, peace, be still. And into this great storm, your word says that a great calm came upon the waters. Father, speak a great calm into this pandemic. Speak a great calm into this nation's psyche. Speak a great calm into our lives who have entrusted our lives into your hands. Thank you for the wounded hands of Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the ascension where you presented the true blood of the sacrifice, the true blood of the covenant into the real Holy of Holies by which you sent us the Spirit, Lord. Thank you for truth and grace. Thank you for the understanding surpassing peace. Thank you for the joy of the Lord, the joy of Jesus, which bubbles up within. And thank you for an everlasting eternal hope that you who have promised us eternal life, you keep your promises, Lord. And we give you praise for that. Thanks for this time when we can gather together and those who will be watching or listening later, I pray your blessing upon all of our lives. We thank you that we are already blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And for that, we give you thanks. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we call, come to Psalm 15 today. It's a very short psalm, only five verses. And I read it and I go, hmm. So I'll explain it as we go. It's very short and very to the point. So Psalm 15, verses 1 through 5, it, it's a psalm of David attributed to David the king, the shepherd boy. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, and who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. So we begin with two questions, and this psalm is built on a series of couplets, one and two, one and two, one and two, all the way through the psalm until the very last line is kind of the conclusion of the psalm. But he begins with a couplet of questions. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? So that tent may be, looking backwards to the the tabernacle, that tent which um, they took with them throughout the wilderness wanderings. Moses was um, the center figure in that journey. And that tent would have been where the Ark of the Covenant and the instruments of the, co of the covenant, such as the table of showbread and the menorah and so on, were the, the candlesticks were in that, that tent. And you have the altar at the, at the front where the sacrifices were made. So it's very much a tent that was prescribed by the law However, it could also be the tent that David erected. This is the, uh, one of the few pictures I could find that didn't have a copyright to it. I, I suspect that the tent was much bigger, but in 2 uh, Samuel 6.17, we're told that David erected a tent for it when he brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Remember that story? He comes in and he, he's so thrilled that the Ark of the Covenant is, is coming in 
that he strips down to his, his loincloth and dances before the ark as, as it comes in. And his m wife, Michael, who he had received because of his winning uh, over Goliath from Saul had given him his daughter, Michael, she criticizes him. It's, it's that story. And we read in 2 Samuel 6, 17, So they brought in, in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So this was no longer the, the tent of the tabernacle. It was a, a specific tent that David had erected for the occasion. So when it says, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? It may be, again, a play on words looking back towards that tent that, that they used throughout the wilderness wanderings or the tent of David. Or it may be even looking forward uh, or interpreted later, at least, as the, the temple. That was no longer a tent, but as a temple. And then secondly, it says, who may dwell on your holy hill? And again, if we look back to the Exodus wanderings and to the Exodus journey, we know that Mount Sinai was the holy hill, the holy mountain. The word hill is also translated as mountain. So it could be referring back to that along with the, the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Or as in David's day, it could refer to the holy hill, which is Jerusalem. And in that sense, why was Jerusalem holy? There was no temple yet. There was David's tent on it, uh, erected on the, the, on the hill. But if you remember back to the story of Abraham, this is Mount Moriah, where God instructed Abraham to take Isaac and, uh, and offer up Isaac on top of Mount Moriah. Of course, at the last moment, God stopped Abraham from offering him up. Him up. But that was a type, a shadow of the true sacrifice to come that would take place on that very mountain, the holy hill of God, Jerusalem. So which is it? I think, again, it may be both. Um, it's, it leaves it unspecified, and when it's unspecified, I think there is this rich history in, he, in the Hebrew culture which uh, speaks both. So, O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? So he's asking a question. Who has the the integrity of life to be in your presence, to live with you, to dwell with you. And so then the rest of the psalm is answering those two primary questions. And here's where we get into the couplets. He who walks with integrity and works righteousness. So integrity is defined as someone who is complete and sound in their actions. They're, they're not left wanting for anything. And their actions are sound. They they do the right thing. And then coupled with that and works righteousness. Well, that word righteousness has in the Hebrew language has to do with keeping the tenets of the law. And so we see and works the works of the law and works righteousness. And so here we have that standard of covenant keeping of the covenant keeping Hebrew person that they would be living a life of integrity if they were keeping the works of the law, if they were keeping the law. So right off the bat, the first answer to those questions, who has the right to dwell, to be with you in your tent, to dwell with you? It's those who keep the law. Moving on to the second couplet. Oh, that, that describes then a person with right behavior. So the person who has the right to be with God in his presence is a person with the right behavior. We go on and it says, and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue and speaks truth in his heart. Where, do, where does our language begin? We always think of heart, I was even doing it unconsciously, but our heart, according to the Hebrew person, is our mind and will, that innermost being, which would include the emotions, but primarily it's your thought life. And so what David is getting at is when you have a thought life that speaks truth, then what comes out of your mouth tends to be truth. If your thought life is dwelling on evil and lies, then what comes out of your mouth is evil and lies. He does not slander with his tongue. So now we move from mind to actually our mouth. And he doesn't slander people. He doesn't speak falsehood. He doesn't put people in a bad light, or she doesn't, this, this person. And so what we find is a person with right speech, both in their thinking and also when it comes out of their mouth. We move on to the third couplet. Nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. So this person in reacting to the neighbors around them. Part of the covenant was to live in community with people and to be loving and forgiving and generous 
and to be protecting of each other and to put others ahead of ourselves, all of that. Uh, secondly, it was to not take up a reproach against a friend. And that word friend, again, is a, a loaded Hebrew term that means a person that you're in covenant with. And so as the people of Israel, as the people of the Hebrew nation, they were in covenant with God, but by being in covenant with God, they were in covenant with each other. And so they were not, they, uh, were not to take up a recro reproach against a friend. That was to scorn a friend or to taunt a friend, to belittle them. And so this person who can has the right to dwell with God in his presence, in his tent, is a person who has right relationships with their neighbors. We move on to the next couplet, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. I'm kind of in trouble here because I've been a horrible repro reprobate in my life but who honors those who fear the Lord. So here's a contrast in this couplet. In whose eyes a reprobate, that's one who's been rejected because of their failure to keep the law within the context. And so this person despises those who don't keep the law, who have been rejected because of their breaking the law, but who honors those who fear the Lord. Who are those who fear the Lord, who hold the Lord in reverence? In such reverence that they keep the rules of the law, they keep the law, even those two greatest commandments of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with everything you have, and you, sh you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So if we look at this, it's a person who has right judgment on, on viewing other people. Are they people who are repro reprobates, or are they people who sincerely fear the Lord? We move on to the next couplet, and it says, he swears to his own hurt and does not change. This one kind of threw me. I read a lot about just this little verse here. They're not completely sure what it means, but what it, would it, it, what it appears to mean is that this person who swears, who makes an oath, does so even if it's going to hurt themselves. So they're true to their word is what it's getting at. They're true to, the wor true to their word even if it bounces back on them and causes themselves harm. They will still be true to their word and does not change. So when they give their word, when they promise something, they don't change their mind about it. They keep on. And so what we have is a person who is right in their word keeping, or I also thought about right in promising, right in their promises, but right in word keeping. To us, keeping your word doesn't have the weight that it had for former generations, and especially for the Hebrew people. Keeping your word is extremely important to God. Early in my ministry, I had a couple who I counseled and uh, it became very apparent to me that this couple probably shouldn't be getting married at this point. But I had given them my word I would do the marriage. And so when I was thinking about backing out of it, the Lord told me, you gave them your word, Grand. You gave them your word. And so word keeping, promise keeping is very important to our Lord. And, and yet, where do we find ourselves? We tend to be promise breakers. We tend to be word breakers. Um, then we get to the next couplet. He who does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He does not put out his money at interest. In that society, lenders could charge up to 50% interest compounded. And so the debt would just go up and up and up. And who is it that most needs to borrow money. We have these money lending firms in our society. We have one, one right here in Bremerton and they, they charge exorbitant, ex, how do, however you pronounce that word, interest rates to people. And who is it that are getting their loans based on their paycheck, giving them so much percentage of their paycheck? It's those who are the poorest of the poor are having to go to those kinds of agencies who ch charge such high interest. And so it says, this person who has the right to dwell in the tent, to live in the presence of God, doesn't charge this ridiculous interest rate to people, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. That's one small occasion of the wider picture of taking bribes in general. But more to the point, this person doesn't take bribes over and against people who are innocent, harming them by doing so. Which oftentimes wealthy people, they have no qualms about taking a bribe, which may hurt innocent pre people. So in this sense, this person is a person with right business dealings. So again, 
you have these, I think it's seven couplets that describe this person, or six couplets it is, that describe this person who has the right to dwell in God's presence. So again, the questions were, O Lord, speaking of Yahweh, speaking of Jesus, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? And the answer is, the one with right behavior, right speech, oh, I spelled speech wrong there, I thought I corrected that, right relationships, right judgment, right word keeping, right promise keeping, and right business dealings. I look at that, oh, then it, he concludes with, he who does these things will never be shaken. The one is not just referring to men in the psalm. It was a patriarchal society, so they use that male language, but it, it, it would include women as well, of course. He who does these things will never be shaken. Their stability, they have such a foundation beneath them that they won't be tottered by anything. Well, I look at my life, and I look at David's life, and I fall far short of these requirements. Does that mean I don't get to dwell in his tent, that I don't get to be in his presence, dwell in his presence? And so there is this conundrum presented here, because David himself fails at every, every occasion in this, maybe other than the using the bribery or the... But in that sense, he even did that with Bathsheba. I think of Bathsheba and Uriah and all the sins he committed in that one story or that one event in his life. And he doesn't stand up to his own test for what makes for a person who can live in Yahweh's tent, who can dwell in his presence. It brings to mind the scripture we've been looking at in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. This is a central idea in the New Testament. This is central to Paul's argument that there is no one righteous, all quoted from the law and from the Psalms or from the writings. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. There is no one righteous, not even one. So this psalm then, in a sense, is an empty psalm when it comes to those of us who are human beings who have fallen far short of the glory of God, as Romans 3.23 will say later. So then who is this talking about? Well, I, I think that it's talking about the Messiah, Jesus. But let's take a look. I want to take a look at a contrast which will help sort this out for, for at least for me and I hope for you too. But we live on, under a new covenant. And when we're reading the Psalms, we're reading writings that were written to people living under that old covenant. And that's essential to understand in interpreting texts. Because if you apply them directly to you without understanding that they were written to people under the law and that frequently it's making the, de 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 the demands of the law upon these people, we no longer are under law, we are under grace, according to Romans. And that theme runs all through the writings of Paul, even into Jude and James has it, and so on. And so there's this distinction between the Old Covenant and New Covenant. The Old Covenant was centered on the persons of, person of Moses. We saw the same chart back in Psalm 1. The old, per, old Covenant was centered on the person of Moses who received the law on Mount Sinai. Sinai. The New Covenant is centered on the person of Jesus, the Son of God, who is the real prophet to come. He's the substance of the shadow of the law. Under the Old Covenant, people had to live by the law, which was given to them by Moses, mediated by angels. In the New Covenant, we live under grace and truth, which came through Jesus Christ. You cannot separate grace and truth from the person of Jesus. To speak of Jesus is to speak of his grace, and to speak of his grace is, is to speak of Jesus. In the Old Covenant, it was under the works of the law that people live, that we saw in, the, in that second or that first couplet, those who do the works of righteousness. In the New Covenant, Works don't figure into it because it doesn't come from us. It's all according to our faith, our trust, our belief. They're all the same word, translated from the same word in the Greek language. And so we trust God. We trust one who is outside of ourself, not our own works. And then in the Old Covenant, you had to do those works by your own person, by your own strength, by your own flesh. 
Love the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your might, with all your heart, and with all your, your mind, and so on. I don't know if I have those words exactly right, but you get the idea. It was give it everything you got out of your own strength. In a new covenant, we don't trust ourselves. We know how fickle we are. And so we put our trust in a person outside of ourselves, and that's the Spirit, to do that transforming work. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not submit yourselves again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back under the law, is Paul's message. Or again, now, uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is a Spirit. So as we've been seeing on, on Sundays, in our messages on 2 Corinthians, that transforming power of the Spirit is where we put our trust in. And so we invite the Spirit daily to be doing His good work in our life. Nothing wrong with that. Lord, do your good work in my life today. May, may I be living out in, into the wild river currents of your Holy Spirit today. And then we saw in 2 Corinthians that it was called the ministry of death engraved with letters on stone. And so we saw... And we see in that story of Exodus chapter 34 and 30, or actually 32, 33, and 34, that this ministry, when Moses brought the tablets down off the mountain, the people were worshiping a golden calf. And as a result, 3,000 people lost their life. In 2 Corinthians, Paul calls the ministry of the Spirit of this new covenant, he calls it the, the ministry of the Spirit that gives life. And when the Spirit fell on the church in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people came to life. So the old covenant brought death because nobody could keep it. The new covenant, under the Spirit and under trusting what God can do in our life, it gives us life. Furthermore, um, where is the dividing line then between the old covenant and the new covenant? This is crucial to understand in interpreting the New Testament correctly. In Galatians 4, verses, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, we read, but when the fullness of time came, when that opportune time came, God sent forth his son, Jesus, born under a woman, Mary, and he was born under the law. So oftentimes, if you take your Bible and go to the very first uh, chapter of Matthew, turn one page back, it will say the New Covenant or the, the New Testament, which is the Latin form of covenant. So really, it's New Covenant. And so by that very putting that page in there, we've all come to believe that the new covenant begins at Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. But get this, Jesus was born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we, we might receive the adoption as sons. When did he redeem the, the Hebrew people and the world from under the law? It wasn't in the days of his life. It was in the giving of his life on the cross, that kiting of the covenant, he gave up, he spilled his blood, and gave up his spirit. And by doing so, he cut a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. We were nowhere in the picture because we would foul it up. And the new covenant begins the moment he takes his last breath, the moment he dies. It says, I think it is in Hebrew or, or Hebrews or Galatians, Hebrews, I think it is. It says, a will does not come into full effect until the death of the testator, the one who made the will. In the same sense, speaking of, of the covenant, it doesn't come into effect until the death of the one who made it. And Jesus, upon his death, the new covenant is inaugurated. Of course, there's a filling out of it with the giving of the Spirit, both to the, to the Hebrew people and then to the Gentiles later on. So it, it kind of flows out over a period of time, a couple of months. And then in John 1, 16 and 17, it says, For of his fullness we have all received, not just Christians, but the whole world. For of his fullness we all have received, and grace upon grace, literally grace after grace, these ocean waves of his grace crashing down on all of our heads. Even those who are the most evil, they've had ocean waves of grace crashing down on their heads throughout their lives. It's what sustains us. It what, it's what protects us. He holds our very lives together. And then it says, for the law was given through Moses. See the cross there? The dividing line of the covenants is the cross, not the birth of Jesus. For though for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. 
And so we came to know grace and truth through the Son, through Jesus Christ. What this means then is that the Old Covenant ends when you have Matthew 1, 1 through 27, 50. That's still under the Old Covenant. Same with Mark, Luke, and John. That Old Covenant ends at 2750 in Matthew, Mark 1537, Luke 2346, John 1930. So our, some people are going to say, well, you're throwing out the Gospels. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is the Gospels are, are unique books. They're the bridge between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Oftentimes Jesus is speaking to those under the law. Still, he was born under the law and speaking to those born under the law, knowing that the redemption is coming when he gives up his life on the cross. But then Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are taking what Jesus said to people under the law and telling that story to the church. And so we have to be careful how we interpret it because oftentimes Jesus is speaking to those directly under the law and upholding that law, if you will. The new covenant begins at Matthew 27, 51, Mark 15, 38, Luke 23, 47, John 19, 31. And why do I say that? That's after Jesus' death. That's the moment after Jesus' death. That's where the new covenant begins. And so if you look at those last verses, this is the closing of the old covenant. Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus cried out again with a, a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Mark 15, 37, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Luke 23, 46, and Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Or John 19, 30, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. When he says, it is finished, that's a word that has three definitions in the really good uh, Greek uh, dictionary that I use. It is finished can mean, it is finished in the sense that the debt has been paid in full. The debt of our, of our sin has been paid in full by the blood of Jesus and by his death. That debt is wiped out. We, no, we have no longer any debt under the law, no longer any debt because of our sin before God the Father, which means we are completely forgiven. Secondly, it meant the just requirements of the law have been fulfilled. It is finished. There are no longer any of the requirements of the law, nor the curse of the law, left to be fulfilled. In that sense of it is finished, in terms of our righteousness and our well-being and so on. Lastly, it was a Roman battle cry. It's a Greek word, and so it was a Roman battle, battle cry. And they would shout it, the general would shout it from a hilltop when he saw that the battle was won. He could see all the battles going on, all the skirmishes. There were still some battles left to be uh, uh, finished, mopped up, if you will. But the battle is won. And so he would cry out this word, it is finished. And so Jesus crying out from the cross is saying, the debt is paid in full. The righteous demands of the law have been met in my body. And the battle is won. Satan has been vanquished. And then he bows his head and gives up his spirit. It is finished. And at that moment, what happened in, in the temple when Jesus died? The veil that separated the inner part of the, the uh, temple, that holy of holies, from the outer part, the holy place, it was rent and it split in two and the, and the, and the, the path into the holy of holies was opened up. What that meant was the sacrifices of the law were no longer needed because the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus had been mediated, had taken place. And by the closing of the temple in the year 70, that kind of mopping up, the law now, that old covenant has been surplanted by a new covenant. It has been, it hasn't, it, we're not throwing out the old, old covenant in that sense, but the new covenant is built on the foundation of the old. You cannot live under two contracts at the same time. And so you can either let, live by one contract and its standards or by the new covenant and by its standards. So I, th I thought about applying both Romans and this idea of where the covenant begins and so on. 
and the differences between living under the law and living in, in the new covenant, living by faith and the spirit and so on. And I thought about, is there any person in the old covenant or in the new covenant that, or in the old covenant, even leading up to the cross, that seems to fit the bill pretty well for the person described in Psalm 15. And I thought about the rich young ruler. He's one of my favorite characters. I love to tell this story. And so I'm going to take a whirlwind tour of the rich young ruler uh, in Mark. It's found in three different passages in Luke and Matthew and Mark. And so I'm going to read this part first. And as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him. This is Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. Again, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 19. And we read, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not uh, steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And so we have this man who runs up to Jesus. We know that he was rich because later on in Mark uh, chapter 10, verse 22, it says, But at these words he was saddened. And he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And later on, Jesus talks about how hard it is for a rich person, a rich man, to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we know he's rich. If we go over to one of the parallel passages in Matthew 19, 20, it tells us this, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? So this young man, we know that he was young. He was a rich, young, and then we get to uh, Luke, uh, the other parallel passage in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, a ruler questioned, questioned him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This word ruler could have meant that he was a ruler of the synagogue, or it could have meant that he was a ruler of the Sanhedrin. He was part of that ruling body in Jerusalem of the Sanhedrin. There's no way for us to be sure about which it was. I tend to think that he was a ruler of the Sanhedrin. And so we begin and it says, and he was setting out on a journey. Keep that in mind. Jesus was setting out on a journey. And as with all journeys, journeys are interrupted, right? When you're ready to go, somebody shows up at the house. Uh, oftentimes when we were getting ready to go on vacation, something would come up in my ministry that demanded my attention, rightfully so, no complaint. But our journey would be waylaid for a, for a brief time. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. In that day, grown men did not run because they would have to gird up their, lo uh, their robes, tie them around their waist, which would leave their skinny legs sticking out. And so it was thought to be not holding to decorum to, for a grown man to run. But this man runs up to Jesus. He didn't want to miss Jesus. And he kneels before him, which was unusual to kneel before uh, a person. And so it gets at the fervency of this man's heart. And then he says to him, he says, and he asks him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a profound and important question. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He's not asking what God has to do for us to receive eternal life. What, what are the requirements for me? And if you think about in that Psalm 5, that the requirements of the person who gets to dwell in the tent, but who gets to dwell in the real temple, who gets to dwell in the real presence of God, was a righteous life. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. It comes as a slap in his face. Get this, it goes right in line with Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good, not even one. Why do you call me good? And I think, well, Jesus, of course, you are you are the person, the single person on the planet who could say that you were good, but living as a perfect human being, he doesn't want to take credit. And so he says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. The rich young ruler's question was, what shall I do to inherit, inherit eternal life? And Jesus' answer is, there is no one who's good, not even you are good enough. And then he goes on and he says, you know the commandments. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. 
And then one that is not a commandment directly from the Ten Commandments, but do not defraud. We see that in Psalm 5, in verse, in the last verse, where it says not about taking uh, unjust interest or bribing an innocent per, uh, uh, bribing someone at the expense of an in innocent person. So that's defrauding. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And this rich young ruler says to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Get this, Jesus doesn't argue with him, at least directly. He doesn't say, well, you, no, you, you blew it. You dishonored your father and mother when you... This is a formidable man. Get this. He's rich, which in that day, it was a sign of God's blessing. Abraham was given wealth. They, they, the blessings of the old covenant were temporal blessings, meaning blessings of this earth, earthbound blessings. And so Jacob was given tremendous wealth. Joseph given tr tremendous wealth and so on. And so to the Hebrew mind, we have this idea that rich people are kind of corrupt. They can't be trusted. They've climbed into their wealth on the backs of poor people. All of that kind of sentiment. Hebrew people did not have that mindset at all. When somebody was wealthy, it was a clear sign of God's blessing on their life. And then secondly, he was, a, he was young, or he was a Torah-keeping Jew, which means he kept the law and, and had kept it since his youth. This is the very person described in, in Psalm 15. I think I said Psalm 5 earlier. It's Psalm 15. We have a righteous man here by the law's standards. Some people think that this may have been Paul. I don't know. That's all speculation. My dad thought it was Joseph of Arimathea. Some people think it might have been Nicodemus, but I think he would have been named. We don't know. We don't know who this was. So he's wealthy, God's blessing. He's kept the law. God's blessing falls upon those who keep the law. And he's a ruler. And the Hebrew people understood that God put rulers in place. And so it was a special blessing to be put in the place of a ruler. So this man is triply blessed. This man is Billy Graham. He's Chuck Swindoll. Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said, I love, love this. Jesus looking at him. I think it says he was moved with compassion. Or No, it's... He, he loved him. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. He looks at this man who had given it his best, who, was, who had lived such a blessed life, and he said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. How many times have I heard this sermon preached on? I've heard this preached on at least 11 times, in different churches and every time they end the story there this rich young ruler is lost because he he is unable to give up his possessions looking at him jesus felt a love for him and i wonder okay if jesus loves this man why does he give him words that he knows the man cannot keep that he will fail is he driving the man away from him out of his love i, I have a hard time seeing that one thing you lack go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. That same idea is found over in Luke chapter 14, where it talks about the building of the tower and the king who's coming with 20,000 20, men against your army, who has 10,000 men. And if you, when you calculate the cost and realize you don't have what it takes, you're going to sue for terms of peace. This is the very end of that, that passage. And it says this, so then none of you, get this, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his possessions. In the story of Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, it's a movie that takes the life of St. Francis of Assisi and puts it to film. It's made in the early 70s, so it has that late 60s, early 70s music and that feel to it. But there's one poignant scene where St. Francis, having come back from the war and having been completely changed by what he had seen in the war, He's out in the courtyard, and his father is making a charge against him because he had thrown out his father's wealth to the poor. And he's bringing him to the priest and then to the city leader 
And the city leader says, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Go seek the priest because it has to do with religious matters. And at that point, St. Francis completely unclothes himself down to his birthday suit, and he puts his clothes in his father's hands. The priest sees that he's naked and takes off his own robe, this poignant picture of our being clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and covers him with the robe. He lets the robe drop, and he walks out butt naked in, into the world. Is that what this means? I mean, your possessions, that means your watch, your clothing, your socks, your shirt, your pants, your underwear, for you ladies, other articles of clothing. If we did this, we'd all be under arrest. And I'm not being facetious here. We have said that this was this man's idol, so it was only specific to him. But that's not what Luke 14, 33 says. So then none of you can be my disciple who's not who does not give up all of his own possessions. Long time ago, I came to the conclusion that I could not be a disciple of Jesus by my own, for my own effort and by my own worth and by how much I was able to give up. And then one last thing, notice that he says, and you will have treasure in heaven. So the initial question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, keep the law. And the man says, I've kept all these things since I was a youth. And Jesus says, there's one thing you lack, you have an idol in your wealth. Give everything you have and give to the poor and come and follow me and you will have treasure in heaven. One person I know who I deeply respect says that this was impossible for him to hear the gospel if he doesn't follow Jesus. But one thing falls short of in that interpretation is why does he have to give up all of his possessions to follow Jesus? Is it because he would have divided loyalty? Then that giving up the possessions becomes a work by which this man is saved. It doesn't work for me. And when we go further into the passage, we see the man went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. To give up his possessions, to give up all of his possessions would be to be giving up his blessing, his place, uh, his standing as a person who is righteous in that society. It would not be honoring his father and mother because he would be giving up all those possessions by which he would care for his, his father and mother and so on. Let's continue. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, I love this. Jesus looked around. He wasn't just looking around at the scenery. He was looking around at the disciples. So get, get this. All the disciples are gathered around, and Jesus looks around at them and meets eyes with every single person. And then he says, how hard it will be though for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The rich young ruler has left, but the story isn't over. How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. Why would they be amazed? We would say, well, of course it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. They're, you can't trust them. They've gotten their wealth in dishonest ways. But the disciples were amazed because, get this, this was the best they had, had to offer. He was wealthy and therefore blessed of God. He was a Torah-keeping Jew and therefore blessed of God. And he was a ruler put there by God and therefore blessed of God. And so the disciples are amazed. They're, what? They're in wonder at Jesus' words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And notice it doesn't say anything about riches here. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now he's taken away from the best among them. The most likely person to enter the kingdom of God was this rich young ruler. He's the man who fits Psalm 15 to a T. And then he broadens it out to everybody and says, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Again, and we see that entrance into the kingdom of God. So we had the rich young ruler asking, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, Give all you have to the poor. Come after me and you will have treasure in heaven. And now it says how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God, all put on the same par, inheriting eternal life, gaining treasure in heaven, which would be that eternal life. Entering the kingdom of God would be entering into that eternal state of being in the kingdom of God. We continue. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Some say that there was a, a gate called the eye of a needle, and it was 
the main gates were closed at, uh, at dusk. And so if a camel came, it would have to get down on its knees and crawl through this little door called the eye of a needle. And so it called us to uh, significant prayer and dedicated prayer to get into the kingdom. There was no such gate, no place in history, no place in literature does it ever say that such a gate exists. And so it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What it's getting at is it's easier for the largest animal in the kingdom, the largest animal we have is the camel, it's an enormous animal, to go through the smallest hole, the eye of a needle, than it is for a rich person, the best among you, the most likely person to be saved, to go to enter into the kingdom of God. And notice their response. Then who can be saved? If this man can't be saved, well then what about us? We're lost. And then looking at them, again, Jesus pans through disciples and meets all of their eyes. And then he says the heart of this story, the most poignant part of this event. He speaks truth here. This isn't hyperbole. This isn't exaggeration. This is meant to be taken literally. With people, it is impossible. With people, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. With people, it is impossible. Do you hear that? The question was, what must I do, do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' answer after the rich young ruler leaves is, with people, it is impossible. How do we get treasure in heaven? With people, it is impossible. How do you enter into the kingdom of God? With people, it is impossible. Who can be saved? Who can find and obtain salvation? With people, it is impossible. When the rich young ruler first came running up, Jesus said, he said, what must I do to a good teacher? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And he, Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone clearly specifying that there's no one righteous, no one who do, does good, not even one. I read through 12 uh, commentaries when I first did this text years ago, and all the commentaries, they didn't address this verse hardly at all. A couple of the commentaries addressed half of it, but not the other half. One commentary addressed the other half, but not the first half. And yet this is the centerpiece of the story of the rich young ruler. With people, it is impossible. What does impossible mean? That eternal life, gaining treasure in heaven, entering into the kingdom of, of God, salvation, being saved, for us, it is not possible. All fall short of the glory of God. But not with God. For all things are possible with God. And who's speaking this? Jesus? Yahweh in the flesh, God in the flesh. And so all things are possible for Jesus. And so we saw that it is easier to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter, enter the kingdom of God. That would have been an absolute shock to the Jewish people or to the disciples listening. This was their Billy Graham. And that most poignant question, then who can be saved? We always interpret these questions through what we must do. His initial question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to gain treasure in heaven? What must I do to, to enter the kingdom of God? What must I do to be saved? And Jesus says it's impossible. There's a inner meeting, uh, there's a couple of verses uh, that I'm skipping that have to do with reward. That's a whole nother message. But here you have the most likely man that fits the bill of Psalm 15. And Jesus says, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. That was actually 25 through 27. And then we skip forward to Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Get this, they're back on the road, back to their journey. The rich young ruler 
had interrupted this journey. And so we have this whole event, this whole story of the rich young ruler, a real event that happened. We have it in parentheses of a journey begun and interrupted, and then a journey returned to. And where is Jesus going? And Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed. Why were they amazed? Because Jesus is going up to Jerusalem, and they know that the chief priests, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, they're all out to kill Jesus now. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. They were a bit back from Jesus because they knew that if they went up to Jerusalem, they were likely to die with Jesus. They were full of fear. And I love this. And again, he took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to them. Here he's telling the disciples directly. He's told them three times in Mark, once in chapter 8, once in chapter 9, once in chapter 10. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, and spit on him, and scourge him, and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. He's telling them that about the once and for all sacrifice that he's about to make, to make it possible for us to be saved, for us to gain eternal life, for us to enter the kingdom of heaven, for us to have treasure in heaven. Right after this, I won't tell that whole story, but what do we find the disciples doing? James and John come to Jesus and, and they, want, they say, whatever we ask of you, will you do for us? And Jesus said, what kind of question is that? My rough uh, interpretation of it. What are you asking? We want to sit on your right hand and on your left when you come into your kingdom not realizing that when Jesus comes into his kingdom, it will be on the cross. And the right hand and the left hand will be those crosses on either side. He's just told them he's going to have to die. And what are they worrying about? Their place in the kingdom. They didn't hear a thing. In chapter 8, read, read that when he tells them about his death. Peter rebukes him. In chapter 9, they've just seen the transfiguration. And now they're down, leaving the, the mountain. And Jesus asked them, what were you discussing on the way? And they were not going to tell him, because what they were discussing, after Jesus just telling him them these same things, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Boy, our egos get the best of us. Even we ministers, or especially we ministers, have egos that won't quit, including this poor sinner of a minister. Do you hear this? Do you hear this story in, in the fullness of the brackets of the story? The rich young ruler, this most likely candidate, came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, after he left, tells the disciples, it is impossible for human beings. I strongly suspect that this man heard the gospel afterwards and we'll get to meet him in heaven. I, I cannot buy the fact that he was lost at the giving of those words, go and sell all you have, because Jesus loved him. I think what Jesus was, was doing was giving him words that had a trajectory in his life, a trajectory that would bring him to brokenness. He may very well have been Joseph of Arimathea, or Nicodemus, or Paul. There wasn't that many rulers around. We don't know. But if you can get this, that Psalm 15, that person that is described in that Psalm, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and walks and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. Well, it well defines the rich young ruler. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. That certainly it doesn't describe our Lord because our, our Lord did not cast out smoldering wicks, nor did he cast out bruised reeds, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt, but, is not, but not, does not change. Jesus swore to his own hurt to the point where he died on the cross, and he never changed. Jesus doesn't, Christ does not change yesterday, today, or forever. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, like Judas did. He who does these things will never be shaken. I know only one person on the planet who will not be shaken. 
The rich young ruler went away with an earthquake in his life from the words of Jesus because Jesus was saying, you cannot inherit eternal life unless you strip naked and come follow me. I'm being a little bit exaggerating here, but you get the drift. The only one who was never shaken was Jesus himself. Who are the righteous? Those who have received the gift of righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, not by works of the law, according to Philippians chapter 3. And so I, I hope you can see where reading this psalm through Old Testament eyes gives you one answer. You better be shaping up and get, living a better life. In the New Covenant, we realize that we cannot approach even closely this kind of standard, this kind of life, unless we have the one person who is this person, who lives this way, coming to dwell within us. It is no longer, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but this man who lives in me, but Christ who lives in me. And in the life I now live in the flesh, that flesh that had to work the works of the law, I live now by trusting the one who loved me, trusting the Son of God, Jesus, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I look to Jesus. I look to the Holy Spirit's transforming power. We need to learn never to look to ourselves. You are fickle. I am fickle. Don't trust yourself. Trust Yahweh. Trust Jesus. Trust the one who has called you by name. So who is this man? It's Jesus. How do you live this righteous life? By having Jesus full in you, dwelling within you. Thanks for joining me. Let's close in prayer. I'm going to again pray that wonderful prayer of Paul's from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before you, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name that you would grant to us, everyone who's watching now and everybody who will be watching or listening later, that you would grant to us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through your Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to you who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. I went a little bit long. That's okay. There's no time limit on, on the Holy Spirit or on exploring his word. If you hear one thing, we need to fully accept the impossibility of what we've been called to. It's not just the receiving of salvation, but it's the living of the life that's impossible from our side, from our flesh, from our own ability, from our own insight, from our own understanding. Jesus has become everything. He has become our all in all. And in him, we learn to put our trust. Amen. We'll be back on Sunday at 11 for our Sunday service, continuing our study of 2 Corinthians, now into chapter 5. I haven't exactly determined ex uh, which verses we'll be looking at. We, we looked at 1 through 5, so we'll be look, starting with verse 6. I don't know whether to go 6 and 7 or 6 through 9. There's a lot in that passage. But join, join my family and I and Grace Covenant Church on Sunday at 11 a.m. on our Facebook group page. Uh, you can find links to it all over, including on YouTube. Thanks again for joining me. We'll be back next week on Tuesday with the reading of the psalm, moving on to Psalm 16, 17, 18, and 19. Thank you for joining me. Our final blessing is from Romans 11, 33, and verse 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. For from him and to him, let me say that again, for from him and through him and to him are all things. 
To him be the glory forever. Amen. We'll see you soon. Thanks for coming.